The Fermi Paradox Part 1 A Meeting of Most Exceptional Minds In 1950, one of the most renowned scientists who ever lived asked a very simple question. Where is everybody? The scientist was named Enrico Fermi. The everybody he referred to were intelligent aliens. And the question, later known as the Fermi Paradox, would go on to drive one of the most ambitious, romantic, and perhaps quixotic quests in the history of science, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Attempts to answer the question have ranged from the mundane to the fantastical, and have offered a rare chance for scientists to dabble in science fiction. Sixty-five years on, the question is still far from answered, but for the first time, science has provided quantifiable data that have allowed us to place a number of constraints on what the answer might ultimately be. Enrico Fermi was one of the founding fathers of nuclear physics. He identified the weak force that governed atomic decay and induced radioactivity in non-radioactive material. Having won the Nobel Prize in 1938, he fled fascist Italy for America and became part of the war effort. In 1942, Fermi initiated the first ever sustained nuclear reaction in an atomic pile under the University of Chicago. Eighteen months later, he was whisked off to an isolated New Mexico boys' school called Los Alamos Ranch, where a top-secret community, part Wild West Town, part Physics Lab, was already growing. There he was to live for two years, as he played a key role in the Manhattan Project, the initiative to design, build, and deploy the first-ever atomic bomb. Though Fermi would relocate with his family back to Chicago in the end of 1945, he would often return to Los Alamos as a consultant to the team that would develop the even more powerful hydrogen bomb. And it was on just such a trip to Los Alamos in 1950 that he sat down to lunch with a number of his colleagues. Edward Teller, credited as the H-bomb's inventor, Emil Konopinski, who would go on to work for the Atomic Energy Commission, and Herbert York, who would become the first director of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the first chief scientist at ARPA. By 1950, the UFO craze was in full swing and a snarky political cartoon in a local paper drew on the zeitgeist by blaming a spate of missing trash cans in the area on aliens. Inspired by the cartoon, the friends began to idly ponder the rush of flying saucer reports that had become a fact of life since 1947. Being scientists, the friends would eventually move their conversation to how alien intelligence could be scientifically proven, and for an answer, they naturally turned to Fermi. Naturally, because not only was Fermi known in his circles as the Pope for his infallibility, but because he had a knack for finding plausible answers to seemingly impossible questions by using a chain of carefully defined assumptions. To this day, questions that require the chain of reasoning Fermi employed are often called Fermi problems or Fermi questions. The most famous Fermi question, which he often posed to his students at the University of Chicago, is How many piano tuners are there in Chicago? Today, the question is far from impossible. Just look it up on the internet. But this was 1950, and students in Fermi's physics department could hardly rush home for a copy of the Yellow Pages during a lecture. So what did they do? Well, they would start with a fact that would probably be common knowledge to any science buff who happened to live there. The population of Chicago, which in modern terms is about 9.5 million. From that, you can reasonably conclude that, allowing for the standard family size and the percentage of people living alone, Chicago contains half that many households. Pianos are expensive, and unlikely to be owned by any but the most affluent households, say the top 5%, and not all households capable of buying one will do so. However, pianos are also found in public venues such as opera houses, music halls, and bars, so it is fair to assume that on average, the equivalent of 5% of Chicagoan households owns a piano. That gives a figure of 237,500 pianos in the Chicago area, and since pianos are tuned once a year, an equivalent number of tunings per year. Assuming every piano tuner in Chicago works an average week of 40 hours and takes two weeks off a year, and that each tuning, factoring in travel time, takes about two hours, that means that every tuner is capable of tuning about 1,000 pianos a year. Dividing the number of tunings by 1,000 gives us a final figure of about 238 piano tuners in Chicago. A quick check with Wolfram Alpha's knowledge engine thank you, Wikipedia, shows that the actual number is 290. Not bad. 
The precise events that unfolded at that meeting are uncertain, as they were recorded only years later from distant, conflicting memories. Teller remembered Fermi asking him on the way to the dining hall, How probable is it that within the next ten years we shall have clear evidence of a material object moving faster than light? To which Teller responded, Ten to the minus six, which is a very scientisty way of saying one in a million. Fermi was more optimistic, placing the odds at 10%, which means that mathematically he still has 35 years to be proven wrong. After arriving at lunch and engaging in various unrelated discussions, Fermi demanded of the air, but where is everybody? Causing his friends to laugh. What happened next is less certain, as it was recalled only by Herbert York, who said that Fermi, quote, followed up with a series of calculations on the probability of Earth-like planets, the probability of life given on Earth, the probability of humans given life, the likely rise and duration of high technology, and so on. Unquote. What makes this account plausible is that it describes exactly the chain of incrementally reducing probabilities that form a classic Fermi question. According to York, Fermi concluded that there should be vast numbers of civilizations in the galaxy, and that we should have been visited many times over by now. And with that, the Fermi Paradox was born. At this point, seasoned students of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence may be crying foul at York's recollections, as Fermi's supposed calculations bear a suspicious resemblance to a now classic formula proposed over a decade later, known as the Drake Equation. Whether this is indeed an instance of mixed memories, or simply proof that Fermi's formulation was useful enough to be independently developed twice, we may never know. Either way, it shows the remarkable power that Fermi questions have exerted over science's search for alien life since its very inception. And it is that particular Fermi question, called the Drake Equation, that we will be discussing in Part 2.